You know what makes Mind of Magic to me? Good friends. Great people. It's our downtown. You can't beat it. Welcome. Rediscover. Rediscover the magic in Minot. Oh, 2020 has been a year. So I tell you what, let's focus on something positive. How about a citizen of the year? This year for the state of the city, we are going to be looking for one individual who has done magic things in Minot. There's a catch though. I want you to submit the application or rather the provenance that explains why that this individual deserves the Citizen of the Year Award for the city of Minot. So I want you to grab a phone or anything else that you can record on and make your submission. Even if you don't know how to run a camera phone or recording device, we can certainly help you out right here in the Minot Public Library with some great people that can even teach you a new skill. But you know what? We're gonna make this even a little better. The winner of the Citizen of the Year is going to have a $1,000 donation made in their name to their favorite charity right here in Minot. That is all compliments of First International Bank and Trust here of Minot. And even for doing such a great job of making that submission, the, sub the person that is submitting the video is going to be given $100 in chamber bucks, courtesy of North Dakota Farmers Union Insurance. So, how do you get those submissions? Well, we'll show you how. What makes Minot magic for me is the way our community comes together. There is no other community that is able to come back from a setback like Minot. The arts are so important because they help you connect to your inner self. It's not enough to work and sleep and eat. It's the arts that prove that we're alive. We both grew up in the Minot arts community doing shows um, and we definitely wouldn't be here where we are today doing what we do uh, without all the learning experiences we had in Minot. Yes, we're so thankful for the arts community for allowing us to be able to produce and create art every day like we are this summer in the Medora Musical. Thank you so much. Thank you. We all have stories and ideas to share, and an active art community helps us do that, whether we're the ones sharing or the ones listening. The theater events, the visual art events, there's lots of opportunities here in the Magic City. What makes the arts truly important to me is the vibrancy and learning, kind of inspiration and atmosphere that they provide to my well, as you can tell, sometimes it's rather a dead issue. <laughs> the arts mean everything to me. They actually keep me sane and have kept me sane through this whole coronavirus mess. And music and theater and opportunities for expression, it, it beautifies our life, it makes our life worth living. Arts bring all the things that are good uh, together and, and Minot is a rich place um, for what we have. The 
especially in these times during the during quarantine it's been tough to get uh, people together so having all of these different events even if they're online or if they have to do it some different way it's really nice to have uh, that way to bring people together it's such a fun and tight community where everybody helps out each other it's such a loving community to be a part of I think the arts are what make my not the welcoming community that it is and we go to various concerts, we take in art events um, at, at different museums, and we are always ready to support arts in the parks. Get involved, it's so much fun. We'll call the meeting of the Monad City Council to order for this afternoon. It is uh, 5.30 here, Monday, January 4th, 2021. I do want to remind everyone in the audience uh, and at the dice to go ahead and silence or uh, put their electronic devices on vibrate so we can keep the distractions down to a minimum. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Roll call, please. Evans? Here. Dancer? Here. Olson? Pittner? Here. Sajagula? Here. Ross? Here. Sitma? Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a couple of items uh, before we get into the reports here. Uh, number three is uh, our COVID update. Uh, we do have our executive <coughs> officer from First District Health Unit here, uh, Ms. Lisa Kluth. <coughs> and, uh, Lisa, we got you at the front of the meeting uh, this afternoon as well. Uh, that way, just in case a few things do come up that we're able to get you back to your busy schedule. If you wanna go ahead and uh, come forward to the microphone. Uh, we'll get an update on where we're at with the vaccinations and uh, all of the different activities that have transpired since our last meeting. So uh, is the little green light on your microphone on? It is now. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you being here. Well, thank you, Mayor and City Council. And um, I am pleased to give an update uh, this afternoon. We have come a long way here, and uh, I just have to applaud everybody in the community uh, for all of their efforts um, that we have lowered these positivity rates. We are seeing um, less impact to the hospitals, uh, to the funeral homes. It has been um, very good to see, and I think all of us are breathing a sigh of relief. Uh, I also want to indicate that, um, you know, the governor announced shortly before I got here that he has pulled down some of those executive orders. And uh, mostly it has to do, uh, in my quick review of it, was with capacity in uh, bars and restaurants. Uh, so it's important to continue these mitigation efforts. We. Uh, we are still seeing, um, you know, as the mayor has indicated, some higher positivity rates at the test testing at the fire department. Um, but certainly we are going in the right direction. And so it's important that we continue to be vigilant at the same time as we are getting the vaccine out to people. And uh, I will give you an update on that. I could go through all of the numbers and I would be happy to do that. 
Um, but I think that you all have access to that information and I won't spend a lot of time on that this evening. Um, but as I, as I indicated, um, the m numbers are moving in the right direction. Uh, we are, have moved out of a critical risk situation into a moderate um, category. So uh, again, kudos to everybody in the community, businesses, everybody that has worked so hard um, to make that happen. So uh, with that, I just wanna talk a little bit about uh, testing. We are continuing to test. We are um, applaud the efforts that the city has undertaken with the uh, by next testing over at uh, the fire department that um, the mayor called me right before Christmas, I can't remember what day it was, and uh, indicated that he had been contacted by the governor and um, we certainly didn't have the capacity to take that on right now and we'll continue to focus our efforts on the PCR testing. Uh, the state has a lot of Binex tests available. Um, there are always some concerns with the negative readings on the Binex test but certainly it has the opportunity to identify positives um, early on and isolate them. So with the testing at First District, um, we have seen decreased demand uh, with testing and I think there's a variety of reasons why that is, but uh, that's good. And so we were testing on average about 130, 150, a day during our peak times and Trinity was testing, you know, 150, 200 uh, PCR tests. We are going to move now to an 8.30 to noon testing time period over at First District. We will start that on Wednesday um, and that will still allow um, all of the opportunities for those that are wanting PCR, but it, uh, it is also freeing up some of our resources to focus more on the vaccine, uh, which is important. Next week, uh, we continue to do the large group testing. So we'll be at MSU on the 11th and MSU on the 12th, uh, Dakota College up in Botno on the 13th, White Shield on the 14th, uh, and then um, no large events planned on the 15th. So we will continue to focus our testing efforts on the PCR. We are um, in the process of moving back to the Abbott tests. That should allow us to get test results back faster than what we were experiencing uh, with the MAKO tests. So uh, hopefully by next week, we will be transferred back over to the Abbott tests. So uh, the most important um, thing that we are focusing on right now is the vaccine. Uh, we have worked with all of the emergency managers in the seven counties. Uh, they have been contacting, um, been contacting first responders in regards to uh, getting vaccinated and setting up appointments at first district to do that. Uh, we have gotten into a good deal of the Minot fire uh, and police and we are continuing to work on that. So our doses that we have been able to access have been limited at this point, um, 200 here, 100 there. Um, and as those doses have come available, we have uh, put those all into the first responder area. We are still needing additional doses uh, for responders in our seven counties. However, as of this morning, um, the state health department, we had several calls and emails and so forth throughout the weekend. Uh, they did say that some additional doses are being made available. First District Health Unit has put in a request for an additional thousand doses. We anticipate that we uh, will receive most of what we have asked for. Uh, next week, we will be working with 
emergency managers to schedule the rest of the first responders. Uh, then what is available, we will move into that um, next tier. So I think I had mentioned to you prior uh, that the tiers, uh, the priority tiers were to be identified by the governor. We were waiting for that information. That came out uh, to the media and we saw it at the same time you did on the uh, January 31st. So when that became available, that allowed us um, to do some better planning. So we know that most of the healthcare workers in our seven counties that want vaccine have been vaccinated, most of the frontline healthcare workers. Um, Long-term care, they have not completed all those vaccines. Um, those have been contracted with the pharmaceutical company and they will be done by about the third week of January. First District is going to continue to work on that community group. So they have various tiers um, or, or responsibilities within their tiers. They have a referral hospital system, they have the critical access hospital, and then the community, which is the non-health system associated. That's what First District is working on. So we are doing the first responders, um, the COVID vaccinators, and then we move into uh, tier 1B, which isn't significant for us, and then into tier 2 and 3. Those are smaller tiers for the community, so we should be able to move through those uh, fairly quickly. But again, it all depends on the doses that we can get in. So we uh, continue to meet with our healthcare providers. Uh, we are meeting with them again tomorrow. Uh, we will um, meet with emergency managers this week and uh, continue to coordinate. So I met with Trinity this afternoon to see where they are. They have good plans ready to um, contact their patients when they are eligible to receive vaccine. So at this point, the uh, communication really is as soon as we get vaccine available, we will communicate to the public in various methods of news releases, this is how this group becomes vaccinated. Watch for those news releases. Um, there is no statewide effort. Uh, nothing is moving statewide at the same time. So it's important to listen to your local healthcare providers and uh, first district. There is no list. Uh, I can't tell you how many people have called to be put on to the list. Uh, there is no list. We, we serve 90,000 people at First District. We can't develop lists of who wants it. We'll just communicate when it is available. Um, so I can assure you that we are doing everything we can to get the vaccine in and out to these priority groups as soon as possible. The vaccine will not be sitting in our fridges. Um, as soon as it arrives, we will have plans to get it out. So um, stay tuned for more information. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Clute. Uh, certainly appreciate the information. Any questions, uh, Alderwoman Evans? Um, so Ms. Clute, is the recommended advice for people who are in the 1B tier, that will be the one coming up, is not, of course, to call you. So should they wait to hear from their, their primary care physicians or should they be proactively reaching out to their health care providers? They should, they will hear from their health care providers. Okay. So um, as I said, this is so fluid. We're meeting with health care providers uh, tomorrow to make sure we've got everybody covered. And then I think that you will see joint uh, news releases coming soon. So. We anticipate that, you know, it's like back in the day when we were having high level of cases, um, we will likely be doing news releases probably every other day. So watch uh, web pages, watch Facebook pages. Uh, we will use every means possible to communicate to the public. We know that a lot of uh, people don't follow social media and have computers and so forth. So 
we will be accessing all avenues to get the information out, so. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, I'll re-emphasize local media releases regarding the local distribution or availability. As, as you pointed out, it is different throughout the state and uh, uh, we're relying on the local folks to make sure uh, that that uh, is disseminated. So uh, local media releases. Absolutely. Any other questions for Ms. Clute? Lisa, as always, we appreciate the information. Of course, the uh, hard and diligent work of not only your your folks, but uh, all of the medical frontline workers. So please pass along our appreciation and uh, certainly to those that uh, you speak of as uh, speak to as well within the healthcare industry. Thank you. I appreciate that, and um, that support means a lot. The, it's been uh, heartwarming, um, and I am just in awe of the work that has been done um, through various sectors on this. And uh, boy, boy, this community's come together well, and uh, I'm proud of the partnerships that have been. Uh, working together to do this. So thank, thank you very you. much. Our next item is actually mayor's report. And this is gonna fall on the front side of our mayor's report uh, for today. Uh, we do have a couple of trophies, actually three of them sitting up at the front of the, uh, uh, or right in front of the dais uh, with us this evening. I know Mr. John McMartin from uh, Mono Chamber MADC is here as well as our task force 21 uh, chairman, uh, Mr. Mark Janser. Uh, with a little more information on uh, the hardware that is in-house tonight. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's extremely uh, important to recognize that uh, Minot Air Force Base um, this year was the recipient uh, of uh, the best bomb wing Omaha trophy, as well as the best missile wing Omaha trophy. Um, we've had instances in the past where one wing uh, in competing with all of the wings through, throughout uh, uh, a strategic command has won, but it's, it's quite rare uh, when uh, both wings have won in the same year. And it says volumes about the quality of the airmen and the execution of the mission uh, out at Minot Air Force Base. So we're extremely proud of Minot Air Force Base and the important role that this dual nuclear base plays in strategic deterrence for our nation. Um, the third trophy uh, recognizes community support. And uh, I think it's important that everybody recognize that the airmen would have difficulty doing their job if they didn't live in a community that was supportive, welcoming, uh, and a great place for their families to live. And so um, the Barksdale Trophy uh, is awarded every two years for the best community support to an Air Force Global Strike Command base. And so um, Minot won this uh, in uh, 2019, and so we are currently holding that trophy, and we're extremely proud uh, to support our Air Force base. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, thanks for giving us a moment to uh, talk about this and to recognize it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Janser and uh, Mr. McMartin as well, and uh, the rest of the task force team, Minot, uh, that uh, continually meets with different leadership uh, within Minot Air Force Base. And certainly, uh, this is also an opportunity for anyone in the community uh, within uh, any, any industry or any individuals that want to participate in, I think, that connectivity. Uh, they can always reach out to the chamber, Mr. McMartin, and find out how they can find uh, some collection and collaboration uh, with the great men and women who serve out at Monet Air Force Base between uh, the different luncheons and breakfasts and uh, different social gatherings outside of COVID. Um, it, it has been, uh, for me, eye-opening, uh, the, uh, the, the connection that everyone has between uh, Monet Air Force Base and downtown, as all of them refer to it. Um, it, it is exceptional to see, and that was also very highly noted uh, within the different leadership and um, colonels and Secretary of Air Force and uh, Sec Secretary of Defense as well, I believe, uh, within uh, how much effort this community puts forth uh, to ensure that Monad Air Force Base is home here at Minot. So, thank you. That also uh, is part of my uh, mayor's report here as well. Uh, I do have just a couple of uh, pictures from 
uh, that different presentation. Uh, my November meetings and activities, I did have quite a few, not nearly as many as uh, the previous month, thankfully. Uh, we did have a couple of days break in here. Um, but as you can see, a, c a couple of different COVID coalition meetings, of course, that is with First District, Mana Public School, uh, our different uh, health partners within the community, um, Monet, uh, Monet Area Development Corporation board meeting. And then you can see uh, there was a virtual nuclear triad conference uh, that we were able to uh, sit in and listen to. Um, but there on the 15th, the Omaha Trophy Awards ceremony that uh, Task Force 21 members were invited out to. It was the first time that uh, we were actually back out on base since, I wanna say March, uh, if, if memory serves correct. So it was nice to be back out and uh, visit, the, visit with the different, uh, not only the uh, wing commanders, but uh, the rest of the men and women out at Monet Air Force Base as well as uh, some of the distinguished visitors that were there for the ceremony. Uh, that also that week, I uh, did attend the uh, Team Minot Breakfast at the Jimmy Doolittle Center, and then uh, again on the 16th, another coalition meeting. Uh, the 17th, we've had a number of these governor's conference calls with the, with the mayors across uh, North Dakota talking about the different opportunities and challenges, and uh, collective, I, I think, uh, uh, idea brainstorming on uh, some of the different activities that we've been doing through COVID. Uh, I did also attend the Monet, Monet Air Force Base fifth medical group ceremony uh, out at Monet Air Force Base in recognition of all the fine uh, hard work that the fifth medical group has done through COVID in supporting both the missions uh, of the fifth bomb wing and 91st missile wing out at Monet Air Force Base as well as security forces have done outstanding work in ensuring that uh, those missions uh, were continuous and without interruption. Uh, I did stop over for Minot Water Superintendent uh, Mark Vollmer's retirement after 24 years here with the city. So I wanna congratulate uh, Mr. Vollmer one more time. As I mentioned in the previous meeting, we did have a Ward County Ward meeting uh, this month. And then we did also have a Moss River Enhanced Flood Protection Project Legislative Planning Conference call, uh, conference call with the Department of Emergency Services. Uh, this was uh, what Ms. Lisa Cluded referenced the day before Christmas Eve. Uh, we did get a phone call. I, did get a phone call talking about wanting uh, to take a look at uh, the Binex testing and on how we might be able to stand that up within the community. So I referenced that specifically on the 23rd, I'll go back here. Uh, we did have then on the 26th, uh, right following Christmas, uh, planning conference call, and uh, that was with the Monet Fire Department, not only our uh, fire chief, but our assistant fire chief, uh, Mr. Lakefield and uh, a few other folks uh, within the city as we were trying to figure out how to best do this uh, efficiently within the community. Um, so I, I will give the credit to our uh, fire department officials who uh, had come up with the idea as we were trying to research locations with 4,000 square feet of open uh, space to be able to get people in and out safely uh, given all the COVID restrictions. Uh, and uh, we were able to use fire state or, or Central Fire Station, Fire Station One, uh, with the drive-through capabilities. Um, then on the uh, well, the 17th, we did have another conference call. On the 18th, then, uh, let's see here, I'm behind one here. Sorry, the 29th was the virtual meeting with the North Dakota Mayor's 30th City Manager meet and greet here in Council Chambers, uh, and also conducted a little bit of a legislative update planning meeting afterwards. Uh, another COVID coalition meeting and then uh, was the 31st and on the 2nd of January, COVID quick test conference call updates and uh, another uh, media interview earlier today. But I wanted to take a special uh, note, a special couple of marks. We've done over 11, and I say we, the fire department has done over 1,100 tests uh, since the 28th when they stood up the operations for the drive-through. We're running at about a 9% uh, positivity rate uh, within that testing. I want to especially thank you, say thank you to the North Dakota National Guard who came in and did the training on the start day one's uh, startup on the 28th. Uh, and then uh, specific to the Monette Fire Department, the firefighters uh, and Assistant Fire Chief uh, Lonnie Sather, who has uh, been point person on this, has done an outstanding job of keeping this fluid, keeping it uh, quick and efficient. And uh, Chief, I want to make sure that uh, you pass along, pass along our thanks. We've had a tremendous uh, support from the community since uh, since this was announced. So we're greatly appreciative. Uh, and of course, the different city employees, it's not just the firefighters that are uh, volunteering to work the overtime or the uh, administration staff that is working during the day. Um, but we've had city employees for the weekends that have volunteered to come in and work some overtime hours as well as uh, 
actually our Ward County Emergency Manager and others who have volunteered to come in and uh, uh, train in and work through that. So outstanding job uh, through this. We have adjusted hours. Make sure that you go to the city's website as, uh, as we continue to move forward. I expect those hours to continue to evolve as uh, need and uh, positivity rates will dictate uh, coming down the line. As you can see, I forgot to update my October meeting activities to December and January on my final page. Uh, outside of that, I did have 18 other meetings regarding city business and uh, of course, many other phone calls, emails, social media and staff uh, interactions through the month of December and January. Uh, I'd certainly stand for any questions, uh, whether it's the drive-through testing or interactions on the state level or any of the other meetings or business uh, throughout the month. Before I uh, introduce uh, our newest city manager here, I want to take a moment. I'm going to come down front, something I forgot to mention before the meeting. So hold on one moment. So for the better part of 2020, uh, we were in transition here within City Hall and uh, leadership change within the city manager, of course. Uh, Mr. Uh, Alderman Pottergrill had, had mentioned this at our last meeting, but I want to take a special moment and recognize Mr. Lakefield for uh, a lot of hard work through a very difficult time uh, of uh, not only uh, transition within the city manager position, but then through COVID. Um, I can't tell you how many times I, I called him on weekends or evenings uh, or uh, interrupting every lunch, I think, for about three weeks there and uh, always was on top of things. So uh, Mr. Lakefield, I do have, if nothing else, a small token of my appreciation. I think the rest of the city, uh, if you would, uh, certainly uh, grateful that you were able to step in in probably one of the most interesting uh, situations that we've had uh, in a lot of recent memory. So uh, like I said, it's, it's a small token of appreciation, but I greatly appreciate the work that you have done uh, uh, over the last six, eight months through all of this. So uh, you did an outstanding job and uh, we were lucky to have you even through all of the transition with, the, with our software. So Dave, thank you. Thank you. And with that, our new city manager is at the dais with us uh, this evening and uh, I certainly want to take a moment to uh, one, introduce Mr. Harold Stewart and uh, say welcome to uh, our city council meetings. I think we might be able to keep this one shorter than most. We'll see, <laughs> no promises, but uh, we're happy to have you here, sir. And uh, I will hand over uh, the remote control for your report this evening, sir. Thank you. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to, to be here finally. Uh, it's always difficult both personally and professionally making these transitions, uh, but I'm definitely very excited to transition here to Minot and uh, hopefully start a long period of service here uh, working with council, staff, and community uh, leaders and partners uh, to make Minot the best we can. I do have a brief presentation here um, due to a short week last week and being the first time on the job and, and a lot of the staff uh, being out of the office using some personal time and those types of things. Uh, this probably is not the format that I will normally present, uh, but in the future uh, there will be a report available as part of the council packet for purposes of transparency uh, in preparation for the meeting and, and those types of things. But uh, here today, I just want to go over briefly, just a brief introduction. Um, again, thank you for having me. Um, just some uh, key roles there that I play. I take very seriously my role as a public servant. There's a reason why I chose city management as a profession. I want to make communities better and stronger, and I'm excited to bring that passion here to Minot. Uh, but also in addition to that, I take my responsibilities as a husband and father uh, as, as my most important roles and responsibilities within my life. And uh, I've been a leader since I was a kid, ever since probably joining in the Boy Scouts and working my way up. And uh, again, happy to bring those skill sets here. I have. Uh, probably close to 15 years in, in public service and 12 of those have been as a city manager uh, prior to uh, Minot uh, in, in being city manager in three different states, uh, Ogallala, Nebraska, Knoxville, Iowa, and Warrensburg, Missouri, which is the home to Whiteman Air Force Base and the University of Central Missouri. 
So some dynamics there that I think translate very well here to the community of Minot. Um, I was also on a meeting today with uh, the League of Municipalities and talking about my perspective of, of dealing with uh, local government issues in several states. And, and hopefully that will be a resource to the uh, state of North Dakota as well going forward. I have a, a master's in public administration from the University of Kansas. Um, those that may not be familiar with um, the world of public administration, uh, University of Kansas is routinely ranked by U.S. News and World Reports as the number one program in the country for city managers and has looked to uh, very prestigiously uh, within the profession. They're pretty much considered the Harvard of city management. So excited to bring that here. I'm also an ICMA credentialed city manager, which means I've gone through the the process with my colleagues and um, my profession uh, to make sure that I'm administering and doing my responsibilities uh, within best practices of city management. So again, excited to bring that here. Uh, first week uh, so far, I uh, was getting settled in, uh, doing a lot of learning about Minot and um, you know, come in here in, in a lot of one-on-ones with uh, each of the council members and department heads and key community leaders. I want to take the time to make sure that I, I, I connect well with the organization and the community going forward. I have a lot of people asking me, uh, what is it that I want to change? You know, what am I going to change? What am I going to focus on? And while I've, I've done a lot of research on Minot in preparation of coming here until you can really get your feet on the ground here and, and, and meet people, it's it's, I don't like to make those decisions in advance. And so I do plan on taking the next several weeks and months uh, to, to learn uh, appropriately how and why Minot does what it does and help identify and, and maybe collaborate on some of the uh, key issues and priorities that are facing the community moving forward and how I can be of assistance in helping make those things happen. Uh, but a lot of that's gonna be um, uh, in, in talking with, with key stakeholders and staff and those types of things and understanding the, the culture and the character of Minot and the organization of the city of Minot going forward. And then of course the routine things are getting settled in with uh, paperwork and software and systems and, and, and most importantly as the mayor alluded to earlier, uh, a brief meeting uh, in the middle of last week uh, with regards to legislative session. Obviously that starts later this week with COVID uh, changing the dynamics, uh, we're kind of adapting with that, which will include any time that we're speaking to any of the legislatures or providing testimony, a lot of that has to be uploaded in advance. And so working with, with staff right now on how we're going to present that message, uh, both on behalf of Minot, but the entire region uh, with regarding to flooding issues and those types of things and how we're going to be a, a, a partner regionally to help make those things happen and how the legislature can help with that. And so uh, we're working on that. So it was a very busy first week. Uh, weeks coming ahead. Again, just kind of a summary here of a lot of the things I just spoke about, but meeting with a lot of people, preparing for the upcoming legislative session, uh, getting familiar with major city projects. Uh, I've already been on a tour with the Public Works Department, getting eyes on a lot of the key projects that are going forward, especially with the legislative session coming up. Uh, my initial meetings with department heads will, will be a one-on-one, -on -one, get to know uh, set expectations for communication, those kinds of things. Uh, but then I want that to be followed up uh, with uh, a tour of each department specifically. Uh, I get to know a lot of the staff that are within those departments and the projects and hearing their perspective of, of the projects they're working on, but also how they feel supported uh, as an organization so I can assess those things as well and how we can do that better to make sure that our employees have the right tools and training necessary to do their jobs effectively on behalf of the citizens of Minot. And then obviously meeting with legislature, legislators one-on-one, -on -one, we did have a couple of them come to the meet and greet last week and I appreciated meeting them, but I wanna reach out to the other ones as well. Uh, the big thing for me is, is building uh, relationships, both internally and externally uh, for the city of Minot and making sure that we are seen as a, as a regional partner and as a community partner. And uh, I think I said this at the meet and greet as well, that uh, my goal and aspiration is to make sure that Minot is seen as a leader and one who does things in accordance with best practices. So as people throughout the state and country are dealing with issues, uh, that Minot becomes one of those names synonymous with how to do things the correct way. And, uh, and that's my goal and objective uh, for the city of Minot going forward. And in the meantime, I'm 
I'm, I'm reading uh, all the city policies, personnel policies, codes, state regulations, et cetera, and making sure that I know the lay of the land and, and what the proper process is for doing things. And again, the how and the why those policies are in place and how they were created. And then that way in the future, I can provide some input into if any changes are needed, how that can be done more effectively and why that's important. Uh, but I imagine in, in many ways, um, a lot of those city policies or codes and things are working just fine and may or may not need any tweaking at all. So that's my focus here over the coming weeks. Again, I'm very excited to be here. My family is very excited to join this community and be very vested here. Uh, believe it or not, even my high school and middle school uh, sons are very excited about coming to Minot. That was a that was a big win for us. It's a difficult age to move, and uh, but they are very excited to be here and be a part of the community. Uh, we brought them with all the kids with us uh, as part of the interview process, and they all fell in love with Minot. And uh, we're very excited to be a part of this community for the foreseeable future. And uh, I continue to be impressed with the quality of leadership. I had the opportunity to interview in 2014. I was impressed with the leadership then, but even comparing over that short stint from. Uh, 2014 to 2020, or 2020, um, the progress that this community has made uh, is very impressive and I'm very excited to be a part of that and hoping to continue that. And, and uh, I guess my final piece would be is uh, transparency uh, is very important to me. So I'm very open uh, to council or staff or any citizens that have any questions that, on how to engage with their government or how or why to participate in a process and how and why decisions are being made. Uh, that's a priority to me and please don't hesitate to reach out to me and contact me and I will take the time necessary to make sure that connection and, and that uh, interaction happens in a positive way. I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of the council has. I know the council knows a lot of this and this is by way of introduction for, for the public just as much as it was for the council. But uh, again, very excited to be here and I'm very optimistic uh, that uh, there'll be some very positive uh, happenings within this community over the next several years. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Any questions of the city manager? Certainly we'll uh, look forward to uh, the upcoming reports as well as interactions uh, in the uh, weeks, months, and likely years ahead, so welcome. Uh, our next item on the agenda is our city attorney's report, uh, Ms. Hendershot. Mr. Mayor and members of council, I submitted a written report and I do have one brief update. Um, you may have noticed under the Cyprus litigation section, there were a couple of motions pending. One was a motion to continue the trial date, which was scheduled for January 25th and the other was a motion to compel. Today, uh, this afternoon, a hearing took place in front of the court and the court did grant this motion to continue the trial because it was a COVID related request and the court has been presumptively approving those types of requests. Mm -hmm. And um, the judge ordered the calendar clerk to reschedule it um, at least three months out. So we don't have a finalized date yet, but I'll get that to you as soon as we have it. Uh, with regard to the other motion, the motion to compel, the court took that under advisement, so we'll have a decision on that in the near future, I assume. Um, with everything else, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hendershot. Any other questions or any questions uh, regarding uh, not only the update, but uh, those that are attached uh, to the agenda? Alderwoman Evans. It's not on the uh, report, but what is the timeline you're looking at for the you know what we approved in December for the additional um, staff attorney. Mr. Mayor and Alderwoman Evans, that was advertised and the advertisement closed on January 1st. Okay. We have six applicants and so we're looking to schedule the interview process. Terrific, yep. great, good news. All right, thank you Kelly. Moves us into our next section of the uh, agenda for this afternoon. Uh, we're looking at, at consent items. We have 7.1 through 7.8. Are there any individual items within consent that need to be pulled for individual consideration? Just look through the audience here. Again, uh, these are all uh, items within the consent agenda that would be approved if the motion is made uh, at, with recommendations from staff. Seeing none, Alderman uh, Pittner. Mayor, I move consent on the remaining items. 
Second. Motion to uh, motion to pass on consent from Alderman Pittner, second by Alderman Janser. Any discussion on the motion? Second call on discussion. Final call. Seeing none, please call the roll. Pittner? Yes. Hodrigula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Dancer? Yes. Motion is approved. That takes us to the next section of, of, of our agenda. This is, uh, these are the action items. 8.1 is public hearing. The Renaissance Zone Case M-96, conditional approval of Dakota Apple Partnership. At its meeting of December 17th, 2020, the Renaissance Zone Review Board reviewed an application for the Project M96 filed by Chad Thompson of Dakota, Dakota Apple Partners for a new construction project on a multi-tenant retail store. Dakota Apple Partnership is requesting a five-year property tax exemption, including improvements on the property located at 304 4th Avenue Northwest. The recommendation is the Renaissance Zone Review Board recommends conditional approval of the Renaissance Zone application M96 for a five-year property tax exemption, including improvements on the property located at 304 4th Avenue Northwest. Again, this is a public hearing for anyone to come forward and speak either in favor or opposed to the recommendation. Again, this is a public hearing for anyone to come and speak in favor or in opposition to the recommendation uh, from the Renaissance Zone Review Board. Seeing none, I would uh, look to council for a motion. Alderman Pittner. Mayor, I move that we close the public hearing and approve the item. Motion to close public hearing and approve the item uh, with recommendations. Is there a second? Second. Second, second from Alderwoman Evans. Uh, any discussion? Alderman Pittner. Um, I obviously sit on the uh, Renaissance Review um, as a liaison for the council and I'm excited to see projects like this coming forward and I'm excited to see that this program is working to help incentivize development of, of uh, relatively un underutilized parcels within the city and I think this project uh, and program is working as intended and uh, I'm excited to see more of these in the future. Any other discussion? Second call. Final call for discussion. We have motion to... Uh, Approve, please call the roll. Pittner? Yep. Pagula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Dancer? Yes. Motion is approved. That takes us to 8.2. No parking on 10th Street, Northeast at 9th Avenue, Northeast. The engineering department was contacted by the Minot Public School Transportation Service about the school buses having difficulty navigating on eastbound 9th Avenue, Northeast, right turn movement to head southbound on 10th Street, Northeast. Both 10th Street, Northeast and 9th Avenue, Northeast in this vicinity are 24 foot wide roadways that currently have no one side of the road designated as no parking. It is the engineering departments as well as the Minot Public School Transportation service feeling that if a short no parking zone was created on the east side of 10th Street Northeast immediately south of 9th Avenue Northeast that the school buses along the city's maintenance and emergency services vehicles would be better able to navigate that intersection. Recommendation that is that the council pass a resolution to add a parking restriction to the following location east side of 10th Street Northeast south 50 feet from the center of the 9th Avenue Northeast intersection. What are, the, what are the wishes of the council? Alderman Janser. I move the recommendation. Motion to approve the recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Second by Alderman, Alderman Ross. Motion was made by Alderman Janser. Any discussion on the motion? I was just wondering if... Oh, sorry, Alderman Janser. Um, I just had a question related to... Is, is this, so is this a um, permanent... Um, 24-hour uh, parking restriction, or is it is it in any way uh, timed uh, for uh, school? Thank you, Alderman Janser. We'd look uh, look to staff for a little clarification. Mayor Sima, Mayor Sima, Alderman Janser. The intent was to do a traditional no parking, so it'd be 24 hours a day. Okay, thanks. Thank you, all. Alderman Evans. Um, did you hear anything from residents on the streets either supporting or objecting to this designation? We did not reach out to residents uh, for this particular resolution. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, any other discussion on the motion to approve? Any further discussion? Final call. 
Motion is to approve. Please call the roll. Stanford? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Ross? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Evans? Yes. Motion is approved. Number nine is personal appearances. This is an opportunity for anyone to come forward and speak on any item that is or is not on our agenda. We just ask that uh, you state your name and affiliation and city of residency. Mr. Moss, would you be able to hit the button for me? Thank you. <laughs> How about now? Perfect. Good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, members of the council. My name is Aaron Moss with the uh, uh, North Dakota Fraternal Order of Police, Service Valley Regional Lodge Number 7. And I just wanted to uh, speak briefly tonight uh, to uh, uh, bring to the attention of the council a uh, rather sad uh, but uh, necessary uh, a reminder of a, uh, of a uh, uh, anniversary that is uh, about to occur uh, later this month. Uh, nearly 100 years ago, uh, on uh, 20, uh, January 21st, 1921, uh, the Minot Police Department suffered its most recent uh, line of duty death uh, when uh, Patrolman uh, Lee Failer was uh, shot and killed while investigating a suspicious vehicle. It turned out to be operated by a, uh, a car thief uh, and, uh, and a whiskey runner uh, uh, that. Uh, come across the border from uh, Canada where he had stolen the vehicle and uh, was uh, moving his illicit goods uh, eventually with the intention of getting it to Minnesota. Uh, because of uh, Officer Failer's uh, attention to detail and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, ability to follow up uh, his initial suspicions, uh, he was proven right, but unfortunately in the process uh, was uh, killed in a shootout with the, uh, with the suspect. And, uh, and as a uh, as a member of that department, as well as uh, as well as the uh, president of of the uh, of the uh, union that represents uh, many of the members of that department, I felt an incum incumbent uh, that uh, upon me to uh, ensure that uh, Lee's memory was was uh, was brought to the, the forefront uh, at this time of year. Uh, the original intention was to hold a, uh, a memorial service uh, for the public to come, as we did with the with the uh, Minot Police Department's first line of duty uh, uh, death and. Uh, with uh, Patrick Devaney uh, being that, that officer, as well as uh, state agent uh, Kersey Gowen. Uh, however, with the restrictions uh, that uh, that uh, uh, memorial will have to be uh, postponed, and we hope uh, sometime potentially sometime this summer we'll be able to uh, be able to do that. So, with that, I'll, I'll close my remarks and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, stand for any questions if there are any. Appreciate it, Mr. Moss. Uh, any questions at this time? Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate you bringing that back to our attention, and uh, certainly we'll look for that perhaps in the spring or summer, uh, as uh, restrictions we hope uh, become less necessary. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Once again, this is an opportunity for personal appearances. Any item for discussion on any item that is or is not on our agenda. Seeing none, moving on. This is uh, under the miscellaneous and discussion items number ten. We don't have. Uh, any item that I have on mine, is there any other item that is uh, needed for discussion at this time from council? Seeing no others, I just have one reminder of coming up uh, for 2021 is uh, we are coming up on the 10th anniversary. It will be uh, before too, too long that June 26th, actually June 22nd is the uh, day that the sirens rang out in Minot for the 10th anniversary of the 2011 flood. Uh, right now, anticipations that we are aiming for is June 26th of 2021, which would be the day of the crest. It's a Saturday uh, that we anticipate uh, organizing a 10-year uh, anniversary of not only the devastation, but also the recovery efforts and appreciation for everything that has transpired up to, during, and certainly after uh, the flood, as it has uh, been a central part of our community now for a decade. And uh, certainly we want to take time to not only memorialize the event, but also show all of the hard work and dedication and appreciation from everyone who served at that time, but certainly has pitched in and lent a hand in all different capacities since that time. So as it is January, uh, Time slips away. Uh, it still feels like yesterday was March 2020, somehow in my mind. Uh, but uh, I want just the community to be aware, the council to be aware, and certainly we'll start that planning process uh, in the in the days and weeks ahead. So, 
Any other items that uh, need to be discussed at this time? Seeing none, number 11 is uh, adjournment tonight. So moved. Motion by Alderman Pittner to adjourn. Is there a second? Second by Alderman Ross. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, the, all those opposed, same sign.